here. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the Friday for Evergreen Initiative update session. And again, uh, welcome and glad you're all on here in the room and um, on Zoom. Um, we'll just take a couple of minutes here. As you all know, we've been on before. We started about 12.05 and take the first five minutes to entertain questions, comments, uh, updates from folks here in the room or on online. Um, so I'd like to open it up now for uh, any uh, updates that anyone has in, in the room and online. Just one thing I'll share, um, the proposals for the current round of the for green initiative grant uh, program RFP are due now on Monday at 5 p.m. Um, I sent an email around at the shift from Monday, uh, so hopefully that's a little easier for folks. Um, and then we will be rapidly getting those around to our review panel. The review panel is set. Um, and we um, will we'll get them around and get a meeting on the calendar and try to get those decisions made by um, early January, as we originally set. So trying to stick to that timeline, hence the, the relatively tight time frame of the whole RFP. Um, and yeah, I think we've got a good process in place. If you have any last questions, you know, Sunday night might not be the best time to email me, but I will try to respond this afternoon or Monday, or I'll check in over the weekend too, let's be honest. So um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, Mitch. Um, any other updates that uh, anyone has for the group? I just had a chance to go out and look at some of the field plantings here on the St. Paul campus. And many of you know, it hasn't rained here in about three months. So we were all really pretty concerned about getting uniform establishment of the wide range of fall plantings. But uh, based on what I could see, uh, everything looks really pretty good. Right? Uh, the hazelnuts have been harvested, and and uh, we had an NPR interview yesterday uh, about the hazelnuts and uh, for evergreen. So we took them out to the field. So there'll be, I think, a NPR presentation on for evergreen and hazelnuts probably next Thursday. So I'll pass that along as that that uh, that, that comes along. So Beth Dooley set it up. So she's going to have a presentation on the food component of hazelnuts, and then she was with me yesterday for the inter the interview in the field. So that will be coming up here, I think next Wednesday or th Wednesday and Thursday. I think Dooley is first, Beth is first, and then the other presentation is on 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 Thursday. Any other comments, updates from anyone? So if not, uh, let's uh, proceed uh, with an update uh, from uh, the commercialization ado adoption and scaling group <laughs> uh, presented and led uh, today by Colin Curitan, the director of, of uh, adoption and scaling. Uh, his team is now increasing in size with the hiring of some new folks, building capacity, and love to have him give us an update on the development of the team, as well as, even more importantly, the development of outcomes that are developing very rapidly around the commercialization of Kernza, and especially in recent weeks, um, uh, movement in the area of the oil seeds, Cameline, and, 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 and Pentecrest. So, Colin, it's all yours. Great, thanks, Don. Hi, everyone, in person and uh, online. Um, I think we're just going to get right into it. 
Um, we're going to focus today on uh, Kearns and Camelina, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to have a broader discussion with uh, some short updates later on about some progress uh, with winter barley, hybrid hazelnuts, elderberry. Uh, as you all know, there's a big portfolio, <laughs> um, but actually half of the comments today are more in this realm of, uh, since this is primarily, but not exclusively, our research uh, community and broader stakeholders want to provide a little bit of context for why this team exists, who we are, what we actually do, um, and how we're thinking about it. Because there is an actual um, uh, whole realm of ideas that we're drawing from, from the literature, uh, the applied literature, and that we think we can contribute to as well as part of the generative process for our brain. And then a lot of people are coming here today, like not interested necessarily in those ideas, but like what's happening? Where's Kearns at? Where's Camelina at? Where are these props at? So we spend about half the time talking about that. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Okay. Okay. So why do we exist? Who are we? What are we doing here? <laughs> and why? <laughs> and uh, how are we thinking about it? We're going to address some of those. I'll try to move quickly. Okay. So no one's new to this story, but changing the, the food and agricultural sector is hard, uh, but it is possible. Crops there on the landscape right now. We're not always there. Go back 100 years, we had a relatively diversified agricultural landscape. Um, corn was yielding like 20 to 40 bushel an acre, something like that, right? And now it's 200. So um, we this know year, that this year, 250 <laughs> yeah. in the state. Yeah. So, um, you know, we have a sector that is um, critically um, integral with our producer partners, but there's a whole system around that that includes policy, that includes markets, that includes uh, consumers, that includes science. And so that's kind of in this middle realm you can think of as the regime, right? That's the system as we have it. Um, what we find throughout history is often that landscape pressures are put on that system and that there are a number of floating around alternatives um, that could make headway into that system. I think of those as niche, niche solutions, right? And I believe a lot of what Forever Green is doing is nested in this framework of <clears throat> multi-level perspective that we're trying to, to develop viable alternatives to enter into that system and transform it for the better while still delivering food and feed and energy and agricultural products we need for society. We've decided as a platform that uh, a platform strategy, that, that figure on the right that integrates basic germplasm development, development of agroecosystems, and uses supply chains and markets, you can think has positive externalities. There's a lot of efficiency to doing all those things at the same time, but it's really hard. Um, where we come in is uh, this image I've now sh shared with many of you a number of times that we are shepherding these new continuous living cover crops and systems across this you know, much touted valley of death, right? So the valley of death is full of new crops. You can make a lot of people run away really fast if you show up and start talking about new crops. Um, this top one shows it's linear. It's really not linear. It's iterative. It's conversations, dialogue, it's back and forth. It's that scaling process. Um, we have innovation, try to move that out see how it may be effective, bring feedback back in from producers in the market and, and iterate that process, right? And so I take up residence right here on the edge of the Valley of Death and we go into that together um, uh, to build entrepreneurship, investment, policy, and other strategies around moving these crops from that kind of leaving the lab, leaving the, the research fields into those early commercial fields and into the market um, where it's, no longer, you know, led driven by the university, but by our, our partners in the field and in the market. So until about uh, six months to a year ago, this this was our commercialization team. I had a partner in crime, Connie Carlson. Not sure if you're on the line, but forever and always indebted to her. Um, and in the last six months, this has happened. So uh, Connie became a uh, honorary commercialization warrior, and we hired a forever and associate director, Mitch Hunter, who's here. Um, and then we've expanded our team um, with um, some uh, junior level staff that are now very busy um, and growing their skill sets, including Andrew Leach as a sustainable commercialization associate. Um, Sienna Nesser is a graduate student in our program, is moving into the role of a um, CLC adoption specialist. Uh, my role shifted from a supply chain development to director of adoption and scaling. We're currently hiring a field agronomist and we hope to bring on some contracted support around um, food science and biosystems facing expertise to the market. So that's where we sit. And UW has also notably hired an emerging crops commercialization specialist. Um, 
Uh, the Land Institute, I threw this on here because the Land Institute stewardship team um, is also expanding. Um, Sophia Skelly, uh, who was a technician of the crop stewardship team, has transitioned to the role of upper Midwest hub coordinator, which is exciting. We're really, we're really jazzed about that role, and also has hired a market stewardship coordinator. So I put this here um, uh, in partnership with Tessa, who, who wanted to mention, Tessa Peters, the director of crop stewardship at the Land Institute, wanted to mention that the Land Institute continues to be highly committed to their partnership with us uh, on the basic science as well as the commercial development of grain, grains, and oil seeds. Okay, so I sat down and thought recently about what we actually do. <laughs> and so I'm gonna walk you through this next section. And so that's, that's what, a little bit of why we exist. That's a little bit of who we are. Now I'm gonna share with you what we do. And I tried to break this down and go to explain to say a funder or a partner or a, re a researcher, what does our team do? I tried to break it into core competencies. So I think we have a function in this whole platform around strategy, around capacity, around resources and around shifting policy and systems. And I put a couple taglines in there that have further, um, you know, are fleshed out in a document I could share with you. But in strategy, we're, we're vetting all of this interest from the market, right? And our research teams need to decide where are these crops gonna go? What are we gonna breed toward? What are we gonna develop them for? Where are the geographic priorities? What kind of policy is coming in the mix? So there's a strategy component, bringing all that intel in from the market and from society to guide where our R&D goes. Capacity, if you have a new crop, there's no capacity around it. You've got something in the lab, right? But um, for one, there's an innovation process around that that goes out to growers and comes back. It goes out to industry and comes back. So the same way, it might be kind of hard to think about that researchers maybe steward your laboratory or your fields. We steward that process, the innovation process. And I'm gonna show you some examples of how we do that. Uh, a lot of times you have a new crop, you need to make the case around it. So constantly making the case, looking at the economics, pitching it to industry, uh, resources, we're brokering all these resources. So for one, we support work very closely with technology commercialization around brokering access to intellectual property, germplasm, very concrete, but also opportunities. People call me with market interest, relationships. How do I connect with this buyer, player, um, expertise, access to our teams? Believe it or not, we do try to be judicious about that. <laughs> We're not forwarding you every request. Um, and then in policy and systems world, we have kind of this model of a pilot, pilot supply chain projects. They're kind of proof of concept that help move everyone forward. And we've uh, developed a couple pilot policy initiatives I'll mention. Um, so some examples, let me give you one example of each of those four competencies. So one is around strategy. I'll go into this later, but around setting the winter oil seeds compass. Right? We've been developing things toward food for a while, talking about the, the, the prospects of food, which are there long-term, uh, feed, uh, biofuels. We, we're vetting a massive amount of interest from industry right now. I'll, I'll talk about it in a bit. But I think what's kind of come, up, come out of that is the big, giant door that's open right now that we need to go through to get to all the other winter oil seeds opportunities is the renewable fuels uh, door. Okay, So what our team is developing these crops for, is high yield, high oil content fitting into our um, existing agronomic systems, which is going to drive the carbon intensity scoring around all those. And finding real uses and real markets for the protein. Exactly. Finding real uses and markets for the protein, human and non human. So, an example around capacity is we work with the Embold Coalition on a pilot supply chain project I'll mention in a bit. Let me go back. This should play silently in the background where we did. Uh, a digestible piece on the yeah, economics. I've had discussions with farmers in the area, and there's there's definitely interest. I'm not going to be able to go all the way into that, but it's a great video. It's on YouTube on our on our playlist. Um, but we're doing pieces on the economics, <coughs> you know, developing uh, photo video um, uh, pieces like this, featuring our great farming partner Ben Penner in southern Minnesota around uh, Camelina. Yeah, that's Ben. Uh, relay cropping. It's Ben right there. So this is a way that we make the case. This is specifically some examples of us making the case on winter camelina. So resources, these are four videos, should play silently in the background. They're taken from the same one hour session with about 50 prospective camelina growers. So you see within an hour to an hour and a half, Russ Gesh is presenting the agronomic system, a grower that had piloted um, winter camelina is sharing their experience with other growers. We're breaking down market, um, a situation to kind of set everyone's expectations around this. And we're laying out the um, support that may be available to growers through our pilot projects. 
So this is an example of how we're brokering good resources in an integrated way that allows everyone to, to make good decisions. If you don't have good information, you can't make good decisions. Right? So one valuable thing we are economists <laughs> think about. <laughs> we always support economists. <laughs> so this is an example of resources, brokering resources. Okay. Oh, sorry, here's another capacity example. Um, so stewarding the, stewarding the innovation process. These theoretical diagrams about um, how researchers in the market work together through an iterative process. You could think of it as the technology push, the development of crop, and the market pull. What do they want from it? That goes around in the cycle, right? So a way that we're doing that is historically, the first round I was involved in Kernza, we had all these kinds of actors trying to figure out what to do with Kernza, right? We had breeders breeding, we had growers planting stuff in fields. AURI had their, their projects um, to assess uh, cleaning and dehulling. Uh, Minnesota Native Landscapes was an early seed cleaner, figured out how to clean this. And we had startup companies like Perennial Pantry that were developing end uses. That was great. Everyone did it independently. Took a lot of time. Through a Forever Green grant with George Knorr, we tacked on to assess changes in planting, harvesting, cleaning for seed and grain, dehulling, milling, sifting, and baking in an organized process where the Perennial Promise Growers Cooperative will receive our variety candidates over the next two years. Uh, some of that product will go to AURI to assess specs for cleaning and dehulling. Minnesota Native Landscapes and Perennial Pantry will assess um, in existing commercial facilities, seed cleaning best practices, and also in a food setting, cleaning and dehulling, milling, sifting, baking, recipe development, using product in those fields. So this is a way, going back to the example here, of how we are streamlining and stewarding the innovation process. Does that make sense? It will sell the seed. Well, th this is a this is a um, well the existing market actors would sell this, and this is pilot small quantities with a specific purpose of if we're breeding rapid gains in say free threshing and seed size and seed shape, it's going to affect the whole supply chain, right? So we are building in to as we develop germplasm, we're in an integrated fashion, bringing those market actors along with uh, to move all that to move all that forward. So that's an example. And then lastly, here, here are three examples of uh, those four core competencies. The last one is policy and systems. Two examples of pilot uh, projects. One is this um, uh, partnership with Emble, I'm going to mention later. That was a pilot, pilot project to grow uh, about a dozen commercial fields of Camelina. Another is a novel um, uh, pilot project uh, with the state of Minnesota. Actually, all three of these are pilots. Uh, the one in the lower left is the eco implementation program, which de risks early commercial adoption uh, by growers through uh, risk management, ecosystem service payments, technical support, technical assistance in the field. Um, well, I'll mention more about that project in a bit. And on the right, you see a series of pictures that led to the creation of a new pilot grant program in the state of Minnesota this year called the Value Ch uh, Continuous Living Cover Value Chain Development Fund. Uh, this plan was hashed based on Minnesota's Renewable Development Fund that invests in early stage entrepreneurs and technologies in renewable energy. And I said, we should do the same for continuous living cover. Uh, we had a legislator on board with that, made that team a bit larger. They turned our ideas into a bill. We developed a coalition around that along with a very strong existing Forever Green coalition and moved it through and was allocated $500,000 on its first go around with um, with um, through the LCCMR uh, projects. So these are examples of ways we're trying to use these pilots to kind of be pressure points on policy and systems. Okay, and then a little bit just about how we're thinking about it. I won't go too deep into this, but um, this is a paper that's in review that um, we uh, wrote among a, a group of primarily non-academic um, staff that are in this intermediary space where we, we shared the, dia the theory and practice around commercializing currents of perennial grain over the last three years. And there's three main workhorses in this paper. Um, uh, number one, I think Forever Green as a whole, each crop team needs an effective technology uh, transfer and adoption program. Right? Classically, that's kind of the role of extension. Uh, however, there's, there's a little bit of difference there and we wanna build that partnership extension. The second is there's this whole avenue around innovation. Right? It's, Everybody says, like, we love innovation, but it's actually really complicated and messy, <laughs> right? And the third is around uh, agri-food sector systems change processes, like what I mentioned earlier with that multi-level perspective. How do we get these things, making inroads into um, the regimes? And the reason we're doing this is because if, if we don't build a model around this team, it's kind of that the, the, the 
story of the, the blind the blind persons and the elephant, right? It's like this person's touching intellectual property. This person's worried about risk. We need to build markets. We need entrepreneurship. Right? It's, it's like all of these things, uh, but we need to kind of systematize that and build a specific program around that, attached to real crops, attached to real opportunities. Is everyone with me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I have a handful of slides on each of those sections, but I defer to getting on to more to what's happening. But some examples of uh, technology transfer, there's great literature out there that just really emphasizes um, that adoption is phased. It really requires coalitions and partners. It's critical to the success of a, a technology transfer, especially in agriculture. And um, you see charts like this that um, it's normal. It's entirely normal to expect inflating, deflating, and equilibrating expectations and visibility of new, of new crops and technologies. So I think in the realm of Kernza, we've all experienced the, the peak of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment, <laughs> and then we come out of that. And with any luck, we have a real crop and real enterprise around it that benefits rural communities and growers and provides new economic opportunities. So we live this space, you know, especially with the innovators and early adopters, but then that valley of death is really there in that, that chasm section. So there's whole literature on this. Okay, innovation, like I mentioned, you know, it's much promoted, it's not very well understood and needs support. There's good support, you know, could be better, but good support for our researchers, starting to on onboard some support for our grower partners. But we have very hardworking entrepreneurs that going back to the development of that value chain, uh, value chain development fund, sort of where, where's the support for them to build businesses and market opportunities around this? And so I, I put this quote to, to just emphasize that the R&D core in many ways is in the business of invention. Technically speaking, innovation is how do those inventions find a market, social, and cultural fit in the form of a product that's saleable. So that's a different beast altogether, right? So some of our partners are searching for that. How do we market this brand of grain? What innovations in marketing might be necessary? Not just how do we get a new food product, but how do we make that food product resonate with people in how it's brought to them, how it's sold to them, those are critical aspects of innovation. And so a lot of times innovation is thought of as technological, but a lot of it is about communications, marketing, um, et cetera, all right? So these are some examples of campaigns that partners like Perennial Pantry have run that are really innovations in the use of social media and marketing strategies. And I'll mention that in, in a, a little bit. Uh, also in that innovation literature, these ideas of uh, innovation systems, um, this might sound familiar to people. Um, you could you could replace this bolded innovation system with Grim Green <laughs> or the Upper Midwest continuous living cover community. It's an inter interlinked set of people, processes, assets, social institutions that enable the introduction and scaling of new ideas, products, services, and solutions capable of making an impact. All right. And so we are essentially a regional innovation system. And I think with a, a big asset we're bringing to the CLC, call it regenerative agriculture community, is not just the um, basic research component, but all the infrastructure that's needed to support the development of this. You could call it the bridging social capital. There's all literature on that, that there's a baseline amount of trust and collaboration. That Don, as you mentioned, we came to Minnesota, it was like the next level. And so that's a key ingredient to making these things go in the world, these regional innovation systems. Um, <clears throat> this is just a slide that kind of um, orients everyone to um, the best framework for a lot of what we're doing is one of technological change and improvement. So if you do an analysis right now on whether the relay cropping system works, sometimes it does. Well, I think we can look at you straight and say right now it's not reliably scalable uh, that we would want every farmer in Minnesota to do that, right? We're developing that system. So this is an article from the 1980s that says, Forget about solar energy, it's not going anywhere, right? It's from the National Academy of Sciences. <laughs> okay, and then what happened is cost dropped by 99% on a you know, megawatt of solar energy and investment as that cost drop went through the roof. And now driving across Midwestern landscape, you see a whole lot of solar arrays everywhere, right? So that's the process for them. You gotta keep that idea in mind. And same thing in agriculture. So here's the yields over the last uh, 150 years. Okay, I'll skip over this, but this is just going back to the this idea of multi-level perspective. And specifically what our team is, these transition intermediaries. 
So we're actors and platforms that positively, positively influence sustainability transition, like the one in agriculture. Um, and there's a whole literature on this of how we're intermediating. Looking over here at our uh, lead intermediary thinker <laughs> um, about how we're, how we're doing this. And a lot of this is drawn from the renewable energy space. So if you guys aren't, if everyone here isn't too, you know, tuckered out on the theory, let's talk about like what's actually <laughs> happening with crops and fields and products. Um, so I just pulled this picture that kind of um, makes me think about where we're at with all this. this. This isn't a ranking of what's more important than the other, it's what's taking up our bandwidth right now in the commercialization team. So you see that first combine coming across where, where it's what's out front is really Kernza, uh, the winter oil seeds. Closely trailing, we have um, some excite, exciting, you know, uh, release and early in major industry engagement around winter barley, uh, good activity around hazelnuts and elderberry, as well as uh, hybrid rye, um, kind of more in that ag utilization phase, which is a very important phase. We have winter pea, sylphium, and perennial flax, and a number of other crops that are just in that, in that very important and ongoing R&D phase, right? So that's, that's kind of how I think about it, right? I don't know, is there thoughts that we should like move these around a little bit, winter peas faster, can you catch up? Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends on how good he is. Exactly. Yeah. So speed that comment. Okay. So we're going to talk mostly about Kernzo and Camelino for the next 20 ish minutes. And I might run out of gas just on those two, two crops, <laughs> but there's wider interest here. So we can talk about that. So this is just in the last year or so. Um, I want to start with progress. What's happened um, concretely in scaling production, processing, and products. For Kernza, we've had a number of pretty exciting product releases, um, like uh, Patagonian Dogfish Head uh, with their Kernza Pills, uh, seen the uh, um, Smoky Valley Distillery Whiskey, Graham Pantry has released multiple new products, we'll mention that a bit later, also offering this an integrated uh, CSA type of uh, offering through, it's called the Perennial Share, it's pretty exciting, a monthly uh, um, a box of perennial oriented uh, pantry staples delivered to your home. You My box like. arrived this morning. There you go. <laughs> uh, Sustained Grain has put out new uh, products in Kansas. Uh, several new processor options are coming online. And in 2021, we licensed a 50% increase in acreage. And 2022, we're still harnessing the numbers of what was actually planted, but we think there is about a 25 to 33% growth on that 50% growth again, right? Uh, regional successes, I've mentioned several of these, but these are the kinds of things that we could foresee scaling up to other states or to the Farm Bill, for example. Uh, we saw a great um, uh, headway with um, NRCS incorporating uh, perennial grains enhancement into the conservation crop rotation, paying a fairly substantial, uh, I think it's about $175 per acre, uh, to the point that there was like that's a big market intervention, <laughs> uh, but it's great to see that once we have viable crops and we communicate effectively through experts in the way that's needed, we're pretty readily interested in incorporating what Forever Green is developing and, and our partners into federal policy. Yeah, I think that's key, right? Everyone talks about policy and creating the policy, but that's going to be a lot easier when you actually have the real crop yep. <laughs> that yep. you can present to show the need for that policy. Right? Yeah. And then in the lower left, <clears throat> I'm going to dig into that image in a, in a little bit, but um, we are in the earth, I'd say the first third of um, developing uh, what we're calling Current Stewards Alliance, which is essentially a business association, where right now the Land Institute and University of Minnesota are still holding a lot of those roles that we, we really want to hand over to all the stakeholders that have merged around us, startup businesses grower cooperatives, independent growers that are growing currents of license to do that. Um, and there's a pretty interesting model called steward ownership that we're pretty eager, eager to do. And then we continue to tell our story in the media, um, currents of stories left, right, and center that have also had the opportunity to share the wider um, continuous living cover framework. Okay, a couple of stats. Um, there's about 6,000 acres licensed um, in the US. Uh, I think about a 1,200 to 1,500 acre increase. I say licensed because we're still figuring out how much of what was licensed last year and what's planted. Um, about 2,000 of those acres are licensed in Minnesota. So we continue to, I believe, have the largest single state concentration of currency anywhere in the US or beyond. 
um, well, that should say uh, current or prospective grain sales, just so everyone's aware. <laughs> uh, but we think there's about a million dollars worth of uh, Kernza primary product sales happening. That doesn't include the finished end product, which would be much higher. Um, but that should say sales that are executed or in process, several of which are larger. Um, we currently continue to have three licensed seed sources for University of Minnesota's first variety, uh, and then Clearwater. Those licensees are Albert Lee Seedhouse, Minnesota Native Landscapes, and Brown Seed Technologies. Um, their license goes through the end of 2023. That was essentially a regionally focused pilot phase of putting our first line out there, especially when we knew a producer cooperative was likely in development and we're assessing come 2024, late 2023 and 2024, what the role could be in re-upping existing licensees and also bringing that cooperative into a more central partnership with, with us around stewarding germplasm in the market. Similar to the way uh, uh, we partnered with producers in Northwest Minnesota uh, over the decades. So in uh, late this year and on into next year, by the way, the Land Institute released five varieties <laughs> in response to a prospective seed shortage. It's in an exclusive uh, two-year partnership with Sustaining Grain and more information on those uh, may be forthcoming. Um, a new seed processor is onboarding in Wisconsin under Wisconsin partner leadership and same thing for a new grain processor also in Wisconsin, so that's great. Uh, we hear from processors or from producers in those areas that if they don't have a processor nearby, it's very hard for them to ship the grain to North Dakota or even Minnesota, ship it back, and then go to market it. It's very hard. So we are appreciative of our Wisconsin partners for that. And uh, Praveen tells me that we are likely to release the next variety um, at the end of next year or in early 2024. So some challenges and solutions. Um, we faced a, a likely, I would say medium to major, I would say medium seed shortage this year that good news was effectively addressed, I think through cross-sector collaboration. It was a really good example of what our team does. Growers might not know it, but in the background of the big old fire, we spent a lot of time to try to put it out. <laughs> um, so the reason for this shortage was legacy 2021 drought, uh, increased seed demand, and the timeline and risks for our licensees to ramp inventory, right? So they have a living product on the shelf. They want to produce as much as they're going to sell, but they need to plan for their seed supply in the Kernza based on its production cycle two years in advance, right? So we saw 50%, 100% growth and 50% growth, now something like 30% growth year on year on year. So um, in response to that, Land Institute released five varieties to bring more volume online. And we engaged our Clearwater licensees to source more product. And we also engaged uh, primarily the, um, the Grown Cooperative, Grain Promise Cooperative, to develop a strategy by which a handful of growers with uh, experience in seed production get their fields inspected so that they have the option of selling to the grain market to be in compliance with the Kernza Identity Preserve Program or sell the grain market. The issue was you haven't had your fields inspected, uh, you can't produce certified seed. And so even if you have seed with high German bin, can't move that in the seed market. So moving forward, we're providing greater flexibility for growers to, to address these shortages and, and garner these market opportunities. There continue to be fairly limited processing options, uh, but there's some license to leadership that brought a new um, grain processor online. That was really Grain of Promise that led that, and our Wisconsin partners volunteered in those options in Wisconsin. Okay, market threats. There are threats to terms of, I'm going to spend a ton of time on this, but uh, inflation. Anybody walk through a grocery store recently? <laughs> and uh, Kernza is, um, you know, five to eight times more expensive than most any other grain on the market. And I feed it to my family. <laughs> I encourage everyone to do the same. There's a realistic price situation there that uh, with the rising cost, not just of products, but also uh, labor and processing. We've been told that Kernza processing costs have doubled to tripled last year right so when we think about going from 30 cents to a pound to a dollar a pound that's it's just a spiral right and so uh and also uh variable lots we still have a like a first generation solar panel you know it's exciting but it's like very complicated <laughs> how do you set this thing up you know um it's uh each lot comes in fairly variable 
And so we have a bit of a surplus, especially of conventional grain on the market. Um, so what are we doing about that? Um, for one, uh, we have some grower leadership to develop a pre-cleaning line that can deliver uh, reliable products to seed companies and to grain buyers. So trying to solve that issue on the front end. And we're also seeing some innovations in marketing in things like the perennial share, but also in perhaps programs like lower inclusion rates, but at large volumes, you know, which is not going to affect the functional performance of the product, but could move a large amount of grain and allow for a company to say, we're incorporating this product, even if it's one, two, three percent, you know, into a, a broad line product. So that could be a way to address um, a surplus. Okay, I want to give some shout outs to some key partners. I won't be able to talk about all of them. Okay, on time here. Uh, so Perennial Promise, Growers Co-op, I think some of your members are on the line. I just kind of want to uh, provide a nod to the next few slides, actually. I think in a very good way, like Tessa Peters and I are we're not leading the Kernza, whatever, <laughs> you know, like we're doing our job to bridge that out to market, but really the people increasingly uh, managing this uh, in the market are our uh, business partners and grower partners. And that's a good thing, right? So the co-op is now uh, has about 30 grower members. In the last year, they've hired a marketing team, Matt Agriculture, based out of Boulder, fantastic group, who I believe is doing a great job. Worked with uh, co-op development services and Kevin Edberg to develop their bylaws and membership agreement, raised their first $100,000, 50K through donations, and then leveraged $50,000 um, uh, matching grant from CoBank. They're assessing new lines of business, uh, like uh, seed sales, considering a pre-cleaning line, and are actually integrated, as I mentioned, into multiple of our grants to be on the front end of the technology, right? So be our key partner, same as Perennial Pantry, uh, which is supply chain, uh, B Corp um, startup uh, that's really just, can I just say, crushing it. <laughs> uh, they now are selling uh, kernels of grain, kernels of flour, kernels of flour blends, pancakes, pancake mixes, crackers, pasta, savory pilaf, hot cereal, and selling those uh, in an integrated fashion in the perennial share direct to consumer. So kind of, um, I think, creatively working around large distribution chains to go straight to the, the perennial people. Um, and, uh, and have expanded their portfolio of ingredients they're using to include sandpoint, which is under development by the Land Institute as a perennial legume, <clears throat> perennial rice, I think is gonna make a showing here in the US through perennial pantry. They're selling small quantities of camelina oil and also hazelnuts. It's pretty exciting. Um, and they are scaling up to a new facility uh, in their founder's hometown in Northfield, Minnesota. So this point Don has about providing opportunities for you know, young people to, to come home or stay home, start businesses, whether it's managing their farm or starting a business. I think these are, we need more of this, but these are early examples of ways that we're delivering on that, uh, on that vision. Um, before I go to the next slide, I just wanna say um, like, uh, also, I mean, there are so many other people developing small lines of products larger products out there like um, Artisan Non Bakery, big shout out to this group that has um, uh, that has multiple kinds of products in um, like broadline distributed uh, grocery stores. I think it's okay to say this community that Finnegan's is brewing something up um, that we should hear about soon. Um, and a number of bakeries, dope creations out of Western Minnesota, just a lot of really great entrepreneurship and um, I wish I had time to go one by one by one by one, um, but I just want to say thank you because you're on the other end of this basic R&D process. If we develop something that has no enthusiasm on the other end, crops go nowhere, right? So, and as I mentioned, uh, we through the Kearns Cat Project have um, uh, partnered with a local uh, strategy firm, Terrasoma. That led us through. That led all kinds of licensees through a planning process for Kearns Stewards Alliance. Develop, develop the mission, vision, and um, under the model of steward ownership. So I don't think we have time to go into steward ownership, but it's a way to establish a perpetual purpose for an enterprise, and then put the ownership of that enterprise um, uh, under the umbrella of perpetual trust to protect it. So that's pretty exciting. So we think this is a novel model for uh, crop um, associations, business associations, 
So we'll be building this out in the business model and staffing plan over the next year. Oil seeds. Colin, before you go there, we had a question in the chat from Michael Stoneberg. What yeah. are the similarities and differences between new varieties and current varieties of Fernza, I believe? Sure. Well, I would defer to the readers about that, but here's my understanding is that we've been showing about a 10% per year yield increase that comes straight from the breeders. Not per year, sorry, per cycle. Per yeah. cycle, excuse me. Free threshing is increasing. And part of the assessment, both with the breeders, but with our supply chain partners and food scientists, you know, is going to mean likely starch may increase and protein may come down. Because right now it's a, it's a very protein uh, rich grain as a small seed. And then as it plumps up, that ratio may change. And that could affect screen sizings that are needed, combine settings. Um, definitely, we know free threshing is, is going up. Um, but a number of the physical uh, chemical properties of the seed may change, and that's precisely what we intend to um, uh, assess, not just by variety, but also George is looking at that over the course of the stand life cycle. So does fourth year currency grain vary from first year currency grain? That's a question. <laughs> so he's working on that. Yeah, free thrashing and getting the yield up. <clears throat> And higher yields over a longer period of time. Yeah, that's the game. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to shift gears if it's okay with everyone to winter oil seeds. So I'm going to frame up the opportunity here and then talk about what's been happening it, as much as I can. We're now like bound, lock, a key by all kinds of NDAs, but pretty exciting, exciting stuff. Just so everyone knows, for the last three years, I spent the majority of my time on Kernza. Still work a lot with Kernza, but I spend the majority of my time now working on the oil seeds. So that gives you a sense of how our team's activity is shifting. And peace. Peace next. And we're on track with perennial flags, with the pea, with hazelnuts, winter barley. Okay, you're getting a raise. <laughs> Hold you to that. Okay. Um, so the context on these. You know, we've, we've known this story for a long time, but now we sit down with industry partners and they like tell the same story back to us, right? They say, hey, three crops in two years, low carbon feedstock, um, co-benefits of water quality and soil health, sign me up, <laughs> right? So we, we are just in a perfect storm of sorts of federal policy changes, voluntary industry com commitments, high commodity prices, and um, uh, pressure uh, shortage on vegetable oil that's driving those prices up and a real desire for novel low carbon feedstocks. Uh, and then the federal government coming in to put all kinds of incentives in place uh, uh, as well as industry commitments to all of these things. So that creates created kind of a, a perfect storm where you could go way, way back to the image of that landscape level, a little bit of a shift, uh, breaking a big door open in that path dependent regime. And here's it, the oil seeds, oil oil seeds. So the way they're thinking about this is, uh, and the way we're pitching it to them is, you know, with the right investment of R&D and enough long-term effort, we think we can boost output per acre, profit per acre, generate low carbon fuels and products. Uh, oil seeds, like other oil seeds, have a wide range of applications in uh, seed, fuel, feed, food, and industrial products. Uh, we know that they're going to uh, deliver ecosystem services while enhancing current cropping systems rather than replacing them. And we think that this is a market-driven pathway to wide, widespread cover crop adoption. And, um, you know, reasonably speaking over the next few decades on millions of acres. So some market moves, um, the market is responding to this. And this is what has brought a lot of industry partners to our doorstep. I think the announcement uh, initially by uh, Covercress and their partnership with Fungi and uh, Chevron, or, um, yeah, Chevron, keep all my industry partners straight, <laughs> uh, really made everyone sit up to attention. And then people started following that back around who's developing these crops. Uh, similarly, another group, uh, Global Clean Energy Holdings, is focusing primarily on spring camelina. But most people that are developing spring camelina have a winter camelina aspirations or breeding program uh, in the works. And so Global Clean Energy Holdings partnered with Exxon Mobil, bought a plant in California, um, and is going to market. Um, then we have the subsequent majority purchase by Bayer of Covercress um, and also Global Clean Energy Holdings purchased the largest Camelina company in, in Europe. 
uh, Camden and opening Espana. Um, we also have partners like Yield 10 Bioscience that are developing high value traits in Camelina um, for biopolymers and pre existing companies <clears throat> that are solid early leaders like Smarter Camelina that um, this whole kind of stew is going on, just so everyone's kind of aware in response to those changes in context. So, what did we do about that? <laughs> it's sort of we have our RD, but how do we start to make headway in the upper Midwest? So, this goes back to 2021. We partnered with a, you know, a small coalition. <laughs> it's a joke because they are the largest food and agriculture companies in Minnesota, uh, Emble. Uh, this includes uh, Cargill, um, other folks that were at the table included a Unilever, um, uh, Kellogg, General Mills, uh, Sanopta, Hormel, a number of others were at the table for this process. Uh, Embold identified cash cover crops as one of their top three priorities, along with uh, bioplastics and cover crop uh, and, uh, soil health and water initiative in the Red Roof Valley. And we went out and we, we recruited uh, about a dozen early adopter growers to plant camelina either in relay cropping system or as a monocrop. And uh, now about 20,000 pounds of seed resulting from these early commercial fields are sitting bag tagging on pallets with the seed company in South Dakota. Um, we have multiple of these uh, companies' uh, representatives, including senior leadership that flew in internationally, stand in these fields with our growing partners, talk to them about it. Uh, and then we went into the R&D facilities with pilot volumes, but also with our team to engage them around end uses. All right, so this laid out over the last year to 18 months. And what that led to, actually, uh, let me skip ahead. Ah, this is where I wanted to be. I had to slide in here twice. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to give you a quick visual of this is one of those pilot fields. This is in Kellogg, Minnesota um, in fall of 20, uh, 2021. That seed is germinating in October. Uh, this is that same field in March, greened up in April. They're planting soybean in that field, typical soybean planting time. That seed emerged. Uh, here's the relay system, slightly leggy soybeans, but this was their first go at it. Here's a mature field, no other um, uh, uh, herbicides, pesticides on this field, 95 plus percent weed expression. And here's that field of maturity. And there's a field in the right after they combined off the uh, off the camel. Sorry, where is this? This is in Kellogg, Minnesota, southeast Minnesota. Just off the Mississippi River, Minnesota side. And what that led to, this pilot project, is the entire food and agriculture industry, also because of that bigger context and all those other announcements, but this had a role to play. People were watching this pilot, came to our doorstep. So we're now engaged with about 10 to 15 of the world's largest um, food, agriculture, and energy companies that span um, seed technology companies, input manufacturers, and retailers. Um, energy companies, both traditional, aka petroleum based, and, and renewables, equipment manufacturers that are on every other farm in, in the world, <laughs> um, and, and also our startup partners, biotechnology companies, um, uh, feed buyers. And I had to anonymize this, they have actual names, but we have, we're tracking all this. We have a relationship with each one of these now, whether we have an NDA in place. Do they want to license our technology? Do they want to conduct joint research? Um, our pilot has now led to multiple industry company-led pilots on the order of one to 500 acres. So one of those pilots is split between Minnesota, Iowa, and Texas, where you know, our 100 acres has led to them planting 500 acres in three different systems in three different states to assess the scalability. Uh, and then we're tracking you know, what might they contribute to the system. Are they going to be basic R&D? Are they a seed retailer? Can they contract volume? They provide logistics. Can they do crush? Um, and are they a buyer of the of, uh, vegetable oil or, or meal? And then on down to refining and value added products. So this really has been a, a bonanza <laughs> in the last couple of years. And so what happens next in this whole situation is I think we establish partnerships. We are at a breakneck constant pace with some of these partners that it's really important that we, we vet the opportunity that's going to deliver 
uh, solid return to the university and the state of Minnesota and their investment. Um, delivers on our mission, vision, values, uh, and that creates not just uh, you know any one company that's well positioned to lead in the winter oil seeds, but I think we need to think about creating a new industry. You know, we're talking about creating the, the production and supply chain associated with millions of acres of new production of new crops. Right, so that's not something usually that a single company does. So we're thinking about how we have to diversify our approach. Um, and we want to structure those in the form of concrete IP licensing, but also we think it's important that we maintain our program and grow our program as a public institution, especially focusing on developing these crops on viability in the upper Midwest. We think that the technology, for good reason, you know, if you're sitting on, on the business end, you're going to go where it's maybe easier to do this first, right? But we know over the long term, the viability of relay cropping, double cropping, you know, the last is a longer term um, goal that we want to deliver that value back to the state of Minnesota and its people. So we think we need to be conducting joint research, um, transfer of biological materials, early access to germplasm, and also know-how. You know, like I, I do, do not intend to offer up you know, a breeder and agronomist and environmental scientist time for free forever. I think it could lead to, you know, good lines of partnership with business, consulting arrangements, and otherwise, that there's a lot of expertise here that is going to be more and more valuable. And we should structure that um, and uh, choose some partnerships, not try to be all things to all people, but, um, you know, say what we're going to do, do it well within, within our the bounds of our capacity, and use those arrangements to grow our capacity. So on the right, you just see this is uh, the share of soybean um, investment, I think, in or no, this is in variety releases. From the latter 20th century, um, and you just see this huge shift from public investment to private investment. And I think we're in the way early stage of, you know, still small, but primarily public investment in the seeds. And with any success over 20 to 30 years, we'll see that private investment grow. And I think that would be good thing. Um, and I want to go back and just land on, I did some figures of what this opportunity actually is, because uh, one of our industry partners asked us to say, what's the business opportunity here? So I was like, that's a fun experiment. So I looked at the crops and systems in the Midwest that we could reasonably think one day when our seeds could fit into. I looked at spring wheat, uh, corn silage, oat, barley, sugar beet, sunflower, potato, dry bean, and southern Midwest corn acres. Uh, and then I did some basic assessment of uh, what we think a reasonable yield might be with some further R&D and a value pegged to uh, other uh, oil seed crops and identified that a 5% adoption across those acres. I think the total acreage potential is like 55 million acres. So 5% adoption is on two and a half million acres is an annual $710 million opportunity just in primary you know, the commodity value. So that doesn't mean all the business associated and that value added products. We scaled that up to 40% adoption, it's 20 million acres and $5 billion annually. And I shared this with our tech commercialization department that like, that's bigger than anything else we work on. <laughs> so this is back in the envelope, but it's, it's to set everyone's expectations around like, it's really big, <laughs> you know? A lot of things need to get worked out. There's a lot of reasons these crops could fail and not move forward, but but we're kind of level setting expectations with our industry partners. I want to do the same with this this community. Um, kind of want to, oh yeah, I wanted to end on this note. If anyone's a Game of uh, Game of Thrones fan, <laughs> I think that the, the, this phrase "winter is coming." The winter oil seats are coming. All right, <laughs> um, and uh, keep an eye on. kind of been talking nonstop for almost an hour. So I'll just say a, a few last things here is that the uh, pilot program supported by the state of Minnesota designing partnership with um, the Department of Agriculture is expanding from Kernza to include winter camelina, winter barley, uh, and hybrid winter rye. And this is a program that combines, um, the, well, the goal is to support early on-farm adoption of uh, early commercial for evergreen crops. Uh, for the for the the goal of commercial success and water quality, so we're supporting early adopter producers. Stop. 
No, I thought <laughs> I thought I was kidding. <laughs> um, and, okay, <laughs> so we combine in this program uh, environmental benefit payments that vary based on a water quality model, <laughs> and we basically run partial crop insurance. So if the grower uh, tries one of these uh, crops and it fails on farm or due to quality or whatever else can't get to market, we'll pay out up, up to half the cost of production. But that's a way that we can actually, I think, target our dollars where the issue is, which is at risk, rather than a cherry on top, $10 an acre payment. You know, the design of this program came from engaging producers and saying the biggest issue, if I get a payday, great. But if I try your new thing and it fails, I could you know, go under. So we want to share that risk with producers and not have them take it entirely out. And it's hand. also generating the information that yeah. will be required for, to get some yeah. for someone to provide insurance. Yep. Right. So they have to know the risk. Yep. Half this program uh, is dedicated, the uh, funds are dedicated to those payments. Half are dedicated to agronomy and technical assistance support. We're actually hiring right now perennial grains and winter annuals. Uh, field agronomy specialist. Um, I can drop the link in the chat before this meeting closes. Um, and we also underwrite the costs on the seed and germination testing for these new crops so that growers can get them to market without bearing those costs. Um, so it's just demonstrating that those uh, regions and um, uh, crops included are expanding. Tell them why those regions. Yeah, so these regions are targeted around uh, water quality challenges, but also leadership in those communities. It's expanding. They were more narrow, um, but we're seeing widespread interest across Western Minnesota, as we might expect for small grains and winter oil seeds. And so we wanted to expand the, the region of, uh, of coverage across Western Minnesota and loop in our earliest early adopter partners in, in Northwestern Minnesota. But it's a combination of where we see water quality challenges and also where we see community leadership. And so it's a way to kind of think of them like opportunity zones before continuous living cover agriculture. And we pay a 25% premium for acres that are sitting <laughs> um, in a twist or a drinking water supply management area. Sienna Nesser, shout out to Sienna, manages much of this project, this program. Um, she's running water quality models, mapping growers fields, generating invoices, tracking, <laughs> tracking results, engaging producers, and coordinating a technical assistance team, community university technical assistance team. Um, I guess I'll close by, by briefly mentioning just a wide range of things. We don't have a ton of time to get into, but we can talk about it in the Q&A. Uh, we have two, two LCCMR projects our team is supporting, one on Winter Camelina, supporting adoption in South and Southeast Minnesota. That's led by Nick Jordan and Andrew Leach is kind of leading for our team on that. Andrew Leach is also leading uh, more of a um, ag utilization focused project with Neil Anderson and AURI on you know, flax. So we're integrated into that project. Um, there is a federal elderberry screen that we are on the economics team for. So we're working with the farm business management um, programs to uh, generate the data needed to get elderberry in the fin bin. Uh, and hazelnut, not to forget hazelnut. Um, we are seeing some pretty exciting early success through partnering with um, one of Minnesota's larger horticultural companies in partnership with the, the Kernza, or sorry, the hazelnut um, breeding and agronomy teams that are, um, that are seeing some success in mist houses and stem cuttings. So that's pretty exciting. And there is an endeavor right now that I can forward around from Jason Fishbach out of Wisconsin around uh, raising capital for a, a network of go-first hazelnut farms. I know Linda's on the phone and Linda could maybe share more about that. And Winter Barley, there's been a release out of the Winter Barley program, MN Equinox, and we're in early talks with um, a larger malt uh, house that you may be familiar with um, that's really interested to bring barley production back to uh, Minnesota and closer to their, their, uh, their uh, plant mm -hmm. facilities right now. We all know much of the shipment from Canada or the northern uh, Great Plains. Uh, so that's still very early stage. Uh, this fall was the first year that um, MN Equinox has been on the market. And CNN just took a couple calls from Wisconsin growers yesterday. Industry partner reached out through Kevin Smith to uh, build a case for it internally with their malt house. Um, and interestingly, they said 206 row, we don't, 
we don't really care. We're interested in the story and the opportunity. So it's pretty, pretty exciting. So I think I'm going to take a breath <laughs> and uh, see if folks have questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Colin. And we will then open it up for comments, questions, uh, folks in the room, and obviously folks online. So please um, uh, engage in a conversation with me. Is there concern about federal policy shifting in terms of elections? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's always a meta challenge, right? I think at the state level, we've shown pretty good success in garnering support from both sides of the aisle and built a strong, you know, base of support with the Democratic climate folks and the Republican rural economic development folks. And that's a middle line you don't see very often, right? <laughs> so I feel good about that. I don't know what to expect at the federal level. We're putting our farm bill strategy together. Um, and honestly, I think it's a, it's a big old question mark, but you need to be prepared to navigate, you know, what opportunities may raise, may, may arise. We'll be there and we'll be at the table no matter what. Anything yeah. else? Yeah, Colin, I have a question actually for Don. Don, you don't have enough to do. So I'm wondering uh, why you don't have uh, our border partners on board with the oil seed business. The so map that Colin threw up that shows the uh, kind of the oil seed biz ending at the Minnesota border. But, uh, you know, it'd be nice if we could get into Iowa, Wisconsin, et cetera. Um, what are the chances of that happening? Did you catch it? Can, David, can you repeat what you're what you're asking to you maybe, I hear you. maybe have happen? Uh, I'm sorry. I'll speak louder and I'm not sure if everything is working here on my phone. But what I'm just asking is, is uh, trying to expand our partnerships for the oil seed biz. It seems to be going well for the uh, uh, hazelnut biz uh, beyond the border of Minnesota and just uh, what it would take to get uh, the farmers in Iowa and Wisconsin and the Dakotas engaged and uh, perhaps uh, get them the, the message that oil seeds are coming, whatever that little note you had at the end there, to those folks. I, I think I see what, what you're asking, David, and I think it's, it's a good point. I think there's, you know, there's networks of groups like practical farmers and networks of soil health oriented groups in the Dakotas. We are seeing a lot of- In say, Iowa. Yep, yep. Wisconsin. So yeah. it's, it's, it, so it's kind of happening. Uh, you know, there's groups that are organizing that are looking at the oil seeds first off as potential cover crops without harvesting the grain. So it's going into a wide range of, Kemaly is going into a wide range of cover crop mixtures because it's one of the few broadleaves that can survive the winter. So I think there is interest and in that is for me as an opening, an opening, right? To think about how in the future we move both Cameline and Pentecrest in the cropping systems. <laughs> and it may be that through the use of these oil seeds as just straight cover crops could be a door opener as we move into the production uh, in double crop systems or relay crop systems in, in the other parts of the, of the Midwest. Well, Don, you've been very successful in engaging in the legislators here in Minnesota. I was wondering if there are any that can be targeted, you know, that are across the border in these regions. Well, you live in the Southern part of the state, so that is now your opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's I, I think uh, those types of conversations are going on with various communities um, uh, in, 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 in Iowa. Farm organizations, I think, are stepping forward. And we have partnerships down there. Um, and uh, some of our seed company partners are moving seed like Camelina into Iowa and the Dakotas and the Dakotas and 
because as cover crops, and as I'll just say one more time, I think that is going to open up the possibility for growing it not just as a cover crop, but as a double crop and relay in, in those other regions. And as you guys all know, cover crops is opening up that opportunity in the southern part of the Midwest. So that whole uh, uh, introduction, uh, as we're all watching, as covered crest introduces Pentecrest in the southern region, uh, it's going to certainly, I think, set up a framework for how we move that uh, introduction north. Another one I see with NRCS adopting Kearns as a viable crop, CSP will open things as well. I agree, Carmen, definitely. And by the way, that's, that's national for any state. I think it's like 40 states that have that enhancement or that NRCS practice, I think it's 328. Um, I mean, we thought we'd get a provisional policy like in Minnesota, we got like a nationwide incorporation. And so I'm gonna keep tracking for like, do seed requests start popping up in all kinds of states that either have never grown currents or don't have a support network like that. <laughs> there could be different outcomes, but on the, the baseline level of it supporting adoption of perennial grains, I think it's really great. How long does the the payment of the program going forward, you know, like as long as you keep it, yielding. No, it's, I think you have to commit to keeping it for as, uh, at least two years. And I think you, yeah, I think you work through that through with your local office. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I mean, there, well, there's a situation where like, what is land rent in some states, you know, less than the payment amount. So can you just plant 10,000 acres of intermediate wheat grass? <laughs> but a CSP contract is usually five years. Okay. Yeah. Renewable. Yeah. Uh -huh. And this has to be within the rotation within that five year contract. Right? I think John has something to say. Okay. Uh, hey, Colin, a uh, really nice presentation there. Uh, so I had a question about uh, germplasm protection. So you've, you're licensing the Kernza, and also probably the same is applying for the Camelina. So what does those licenses look like? And, and where's the gatekeeper? I mean, you don't want to be playing whack a mole suing farmers that just are planting the seed without buying it, right? Or, or how the model is. Definitely. Yeah. Is your question for Kernza specifically or for like all, all the crops we're working on? Well, with, uh, as you know, with Pentecrest, we've got IP uh, patents on the core traits, but for Kernza in particular, I suppose, and, and also Camelina, you know, it's more of a breeding thing. So how are you pr protecting that? That's the question. Yeah. So the first thing I'll say is that we have a whole technology, technology commercialization de department within the U, you know, it's often called the technology transfer office that um, is full of the experts that execute the licensing deals. We kind of provide a front end engagement with companies, but really when it gets time to do that deal, there's a fleet of lawyers <laughs> lined up to manage that to protect our IP. And I'll just say that there's a couple strategies. One is that Andrew Leach increasingly knows as well. We have, uh, I, I wanted to include a slide. I couldn't quite get there to, to share it with you how many different uh, PMTAs we have in place, plant material transfer agreements on all the crops with different entities that are assessing them. A PMTA is for, as I'm sure you know, but maybe not everyone does, is for assessment of commercial viability, but it's not a license to sell and produce and grow and market that new material. But if you're you know, a smart business, you want to try something out before you do it. So we execute a PMTA, and those are often time intensive because the actual asset is the biological material that you're transferring, right? So it's 20 pounds of this line and 75 pounds of that line coming from two different places. And it has to be signed off on by everyone. So that's one. And then for Kernza, um, I would say that a, a number of the crops are following the kind of more traditional PPP process, plant variety protection, which is a suite of strategies, but also for Kernza in place that kind of regulates the market activity is the there's a trademark program with Kernza. It's managed and owned by the Land Institute. Over time, that may shift over to this um, uh, current stewards alliance that we mentioned, but that regulates a, a lot of that activity. Whether you can, you know, buy some intermediate wheatgrass seed that hasn't benefited from all this breeding and go sell it as currents, so we can crack down on that legally, and we've had to. But they could sell it as intermediate wheatgrass. Yeah. But you couldn't uh, sell it as um, yeah. as trademarked uh, yeah. currents. Yeah, and if you planted that in the field, it would probably lodge. Be like ninety eight percent. Well, if you, plant, if you harvest it and plant it again, it's I, no longer that original variety because it's over yeah. cross pollinated. Right. Yeah. So, long story short, I'd say a suite of IP 
and legal strategies, including uh, PMTAs, PVP, utility patents, and trademarks. Um, some things I also want to mention, that's usually up to the breeding team. Like, we're not encouraging the overuse of all these legal ownership things, you know? Um, but especially when we may get into licensing deals, um, we see that there's significant value there. Increasingly, you know, universities want to go in that direction, but we still have like public release, yeah. broad, you know, reading programs. So that's totally an option too. So we're we're trying to figure that out. I think for hazelnut. We have we have been consuming a lot of time from the patents and licensing group in the last year. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Anyone else, Carmen? Do you have anything to say? Jerry has a question. Sure, is that a question? Oh, Jerry, just a minute. Yeah. Jerry had his hand up first. Jerry, I'm used to being ignored, Don. Don't worry. Um, the dean does it all the time. Um, I, I I really enjoyed this talk, especially at the, in the the developmental process that the grass, but. David made a comment, and I think um, it relates back to your models as well. And hazelnut has is somewhat different from um, pennycrest and uh, kernza because for those last two, you have to develop a consumer product um, that is an additional risk factor in its development. Um, Two things about hazelnut. One is everybody likes to eat hazelnuts and um, it's an existing consumable. There may be slight differences between our hybrids and the uh, ones grown in Oregon and New Jersey, but they're basically a nut and it's not like there's a whole new industry that's required in order to do it. So that changes your graph of acceptance and all those other aspects of it. And the other one is, um, uh, we have uh, Jason in Wisconsin who spends almost, you know, a good portion of his time um, working with hazelnut growers in Wisconsin. So yes. we actually have a built-in infrastructure for it, and so oh. that 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 allows for interstate collaborations on a, a much wider basis because of of that interaction. Uh, but I think yeah. that the one about um, where the consumer product has to be is is an additional risk. That is, it's a new it's a new item that has to take off. Is uh, not not that that's bad. It's just that that's an additional aspect to developing that kind of crop. So. Yeah, just to to briefly respond, there's um, there's I mean a whole kind of avenue of concepts or literature on that, which is sub substitutability, right, of a new product for an existing product. It's sort of like yeah, current of perennial grain, even the idea of the, the the basic category of perennial grain, how do you, how do you promote that, talk about it, um, is an extra hurdle, but it's the same thing for winter barley, right? Um, is that going to be differentiated at all, you know, especially in the age of ecosystem service hubbub, right? Or is it just going to be like winter wheat, you know, which delivers a lot of the same benefits, right? So how's that going to play out? But especially at the end use stage, it's barley, right? Each variety might vary a little from the other, but it's much more substitutable. For hazelnuts, something I can say that I know people have been thinking of is, would it be worthwhile to differentiate in the market? Because otherwise you're just up against Turkish grown, PNW grown filberts, right? And we have, what, low, smaller, smaller nuts, you know, lower um, yield, but there's this benefit that consumers might want that's number one, local, and number two, uh, in that uh, continuous living cover understory situation. So does that have a benefit? And if so, how do you do that in the marketplace? Is it just through your advertising marketing? Is it through a trademark? Those are all things for that enterprise to consider. We don't necessarily decide that. And I think those gophers farms have, have to have a strategy around that because otherwise you are, easily able to substitute, but you're entering a market where your substitute product is more expensive. There's one other big issue in terms of competing with Oregon, right? The Willamette Valley land cost is really, really, really high as compared to where we would be growing in Wisconsin and Minnesota. I mean, our land values would be dramatically different. Yeah. And if you want a bargaining story to go with the ecosystem. So, so the, I can just put a photo of what the 
and value looks like a harvest <laughs> on it, which is a giant dust cloud. Yeah, and that's all stuff to work through. Is it the positive? Tell your story. Is there bad mouth the other guy? Is it? And I know what you do. <laughs> that, that's you know that's the same the, the same kind of analysis. It's very important for transgenic crops when they first came out. Is if if the cost of production is such that you can't sell it in competition with um, an existing product, then growers don't want to grow it. Um, but if you can still make a little bit of money, maybe not as much money, um, even if the specialty requirement of that crop can't be met, then growers are much more likely to grow it. That, you know, so, so you want to be able to grow it for at least something where you break even if it sells at gross market value. And if you have value added because it's a specialty crop, then you can make more money. Um, but if you if you your specialty aspect of it tanks and then you can't even make money, you lose money, then you're much less likely to get somebody to to go for it. So I, I mean you're the economist, not me. I just do research. Um, but uh, <laughs> I don't want to compete with you on that. But I, I just, you know, I just think it. It is it is worthwhile to note that because these are quite different um, uh, yeah. they're quite different market issues relative to um, the different crops. Well, Jerry, then I want to move on to David, and then I don't know if Carmen did have something, but I was just going to mention there's this whole literature on like sounds very theoretical, but these innovation trajectories. It's like where do these things go? And I think the great example that's totally different realm but is like cryptocurrency or like blockchain. You know, it's like, what direction is that going to go? I don't mean to compare that directly to it, but like a lot of the CLC crops, people have said, are we going to put them on marginal land or on buffers and then draw down a bunch of public money that then also generates viable outputs? You know, like those are all things for those enterprises to consider. I, I think that we're, we'll work through that with them, but I think an important piece is that it's really the stakeholders of growers adopt this crop and organize around it, decide how they want to take it to market. That's, that's their decision, right? To some, to some degree. And the market will speak. Yeah. Let's go to Carmen and then David and then to Tim. Cool. Well, I, I really didn't have a lot, lot to mention ex except the fact that uh, in reality, there is a significant amount of kerns of grain in the bins right now here in Minnesota. And <clears throat> obviously the market is a little bit soft now. So that is that is a challenge. But the longer I think about it, the more I, uh, when we focus on Kernza, the more I think we need to focus on the uh, on the forage side of the Kernza. And after having visited Cornell and the research that they're doing and uh, the, the Land Institute of planting 36 inch rows of Kernza, and then uh, the legume in between, we've already got the equipment that can mow that legume between the Kernza rows. And I think we can adapt a piece of equipment that would vacuum up that, that legume as it's harvested between those Kernza rows. And so then we start using, refining a multiple use for that Kernza. And we don't need to generate the five and $6 a pound Kernza because we can multi, uh, revenue source. And so I think when we look at long range and the reality that I see in these uh, bins of grain here in Minnesota, I think we need to look along those lines a, a lot more. Thanks for that comment, Carmen. I think that's, I think that's an encouraging perspective that's adapting to the situation at hand and actually aligns with, you know, I think the agronomy program in multiple institutions all along has said, especially early term and potentially long term, dual use, flexibility, resilience, right? If you need forage one year, you cut for forage, you know? Um, if it looks like a good grain year or the market's calling for it, go grain, take the straw. I think that's exactly in line if Jake were sitting here, what, what he'd probably say. Um, so that's really great to know that you're along, the, along those lines and I think it'll spread risk and spread revenue and, and moderate pricing, thereby affecting potential uptake. Aren't there some people doing that research in Wyoming? Uh, dual use? Yeah, yeah. I said the Minnesota program, the yeah, Wisconsin yeah. program. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but specifically, like, if it doesn't work that well this year, uh, forage, yeah. because it's such a harsh climate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, like, you know, how functional it can be in a. Yeah. 
and the project you supported with Al Kraus. That was a big focus of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, there were two other. Or Carmen, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, and that piece of equipment that I saw at Cornell, it, it just needs a little more tweaking that so that you could do like a like a vacuum uh, that a lawnmower puts on when it sucks the leaves up on the lawn. You could put that system on that forage cutter between the rows and take two or three cuttings of the legume before the Kernza is harvested, harvest the Kernza, graze the Kernza later on in the season or whatever. I, I think those are the creative things that we need to do with these specialty crops if we're gonna really move them forward. That's great. Thanks, Carmen. There were two other- Why don't we go to Tim next and uh, then to David. Thank you, Don. Well, uh, Colin, uh, I, I think I said it before and I, I'll say it again. I think you're doing a really great job. I am really kind of fascinated with, uh, with the quality of work. And uh, my question is, uh, how big is your team? It sounds like uh, it, it has to be a big team to accomplish, uh, pursue so many directions and have these uh, all many sort of uh, connections. Uh, what, what is it? Well, the answer is, you know, I, I do all the work in the background behind all the scenes. That's what happens. Well, Tim, honestly speaking, um, part of that's true. Don, sometimes I show up and Don set up the I'll whole thing. That. I was just um, but my team proper is me and right now uh, one and a half other people. It's expanding to also include an agronomist and potentially another half the full-time, another full-time person. So honestly, right now it's like two and a half of us, Tim. It's uh, I'll say it's not long term, like sustainable, but we're we're responding to growth and in interest, right? So we're responding to that as fast as we can. But I think this is just an important important point. I'll spend about a minute on. We sat yesterday and looked. We thought of some about this about different strategy models, but also capacity. If you think about an R and D core that has about fifty to seventy five people in it, and people out in the market increasingly with their breeding programs. Uh, and some of those individuals are like a whole lab. They're undergraduates, graduate, postdocs, technicians. Then if you have a team of three people that you're trying to wedge a lot of stuff through, <laughs> it's, it's a bottleneck, right? And there's a lot of risk there. So like when Connie moved on, for example, we're training up new people in her role, but we lost a lot of institutional capacity. So I think that whoever's on the line, if you work on any given crop or two crops, that we should try to move toward having like a small, you know, group or task force on this commercialization, adoption, scaling for each crop, not three people for 15 of them. If any of them are going to succeed, there's a whole bunch of that intermediary stuff that has to happen. And I think we're just working there and we're working our way there. And we don't want to suck up a bunch of resources unnecessarily. And a lot of people, especially in Kearns, are doing this in a community role or in, from a business role. We're sort of in the middle of all of it but it does need to um, expand to, I think, be sustainable and more um, successful. I'm sure there's people online today that I can count two or three that like are owed something by me, <laughs> like a while ago. <laughs> so that's my answer, Tim. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, that's great. I, I, I totally get that uh, Dawn is sort of the, the conductor of the orchestra, right? And- uh, I was he, just kidding, you guys know me, right? Stop but, it. Uh, uh, I, I think my personal kind of pitch is that uh, both the commercialization and most importantly adoption of all these technologies is, is in my opinion crucial, just as crucial as, as the research because the success and adoption will bring more research dollars, right? So my pitch is for more resources for your team. <laughs> well, then, and, Thank and, you, and, Tim. <laughs> and, and, and Tim and to, to everyone else, right? You guys, you guys all know. And as you move forward, you have to be able to justify additional investment. And so, Tim, so what you just said, you know, is exactly the, the case. We need to market the idea that this team needs greater investment. We now have the, the evidence that that's a good investment. Right. Yeah, great job. Yeah, I can finish. Thank you. Um, that really kind of it's done as you said is kind of the work is orchestrating all of this um 
But I think one thing that uh, you and everybody and everything, I think that motivates us the biggest thing is just the impact that this could have on the environment. I think really uh, motivates us to ramp up our game. I know Colin is just working his butt off and uh, to do all this stuff that he, he mentioned. And I think we, we're all motivated to do that. I'm sure the same down in Covercrest. And yes. speaking of Covercrest, of going back to Jerry's point about developing new products and that, that uh, we need to have on uh, line for these oil seeds. Uh, I mean, that, that's where you guys are, are playing the lead for that and we'll pull that, that aspect along. And so it's really great having Covercrest as a, as a peripheral partner down there as well. Yeah, well, thank you, David. Yeah, that has been just a tremendous pleasure yeah, to be working with your program. That's the critical, I mean, with any success, we would expect a lot of private investment and startups to see the opportunity and solve these problems in partnership with us in the institution. Like there's only so much we can do in here, you know, and it may, may or may not be as resource efficient or, or whatever, but but it's critical to have us sitting next to these R&D teams. But then the cover cresses, brand pantries, brand promise, I'm starting to see that we're spinning out these new enterprise or a new line of business around each crop. And that's, that's the goal, right? Yeah. At first it was like, whoa, this is, <laughs> this is exciting. And we don't know that it's like, wait a minute, that's, that's what we're trying to do here. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Any other comments or questions? or stories anyone has for today? Um, I did want to ask a quick question, if that's OK. Hi, my name is Jinding. I do silk room research here at the University of Minnesota. Um, do you have any experiences working with Kernza that you would like maybe pitfalls that the perennial oil seeds could avoid that Kernza kind of fell into perennial wheat wise? I know they're totally two totally different systems, but I feel like we're so early on in the process in comparison that I'm curious as to what you think the priorities and research are, um, et cetera, when it comes to kind of the, more of the commercialization size. Get your yields up. Get, get your yields oh, up. OK. Just... Well, tell that to Emory Wheatgrass. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, celebrity. Cage mash. <laughs> um, Sydney, good question. I guess I would say, I mean, to uh, the point Carmen just made um, about um, multiple uses, I know there's a lot of interest in silphium, right, um, in, in the Western dryland, Colorado River Basin region. I thought I saw some really high um, RFV values from like silphium forage. Is that right? Like it is a highly nutritious forage. Is that accurate? Yes, we have done that work here as well. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, I would say jump straight to that opportunity and build in the, the oils and protein component over time. And I think the land is, is doing that, right? Like there's a really strong adoption desire um, just for perennial forage, drought tolerant perennial forage of a high quality. And so I think we get really enthused that one day these things can and will be on our plate and on a shelf or in our kitchen. Um, but they also, if you know the food and agriculture sector, huge quantities of it don't, don't go directly to us. They go into society to do a whole bunch of other things. And so I guess if you can find a near-term use that'll, that supports the adoption process while managing risk and spreading the returns, I think that'd be smart to do. For Silphium and make that choice with the R&D and agronomy team early so that your science aligns with the market's um, uh, multiple use demand. Great. Thank you, Colin. Um, also, we're researching it potentially at least down the institute as a honey crop. So that's kind of another angle of the multiple uses situation. Yeah. But yes, no. Yeah, that's definitely great. Thank you. Thanks. Well, we are now at uh, 1.30, and so I think uh, we need to close it down. And again, thank everyone for participating today. Great set of questions, and also to Colin for a very, 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 very good presentation. <laughs> we, 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 as everyone online is saying, I recognize the quality work and the volume of the work that's being being done. It's it is uh, substantial and of high quality. So Thanks, I appreciate it very much. Team, team effort. Yeah.
And thanks to my team as well that's working really hard in the background, like literally right now. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone. Take care. Take care, everybody. Yep.